The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Welcome to Earth Day Caltech 2014. <laughs> yeah. We got some really groovy people here up on the stage with us. Uh, my name is Brian Brophy. I'm director of theater arts here at Caltech. We're glad that you came. Don't forget there's free coffee from Rose Cafe over here and Ernie's truck. And for those of you streaming, hello. Nice to see you. India is representing as well. Um, so tonight we're going to be doing a few things. Uh, the first thing we're doing is this pre-panel discussion. Ask a scientist or ask for a scientist, depending on what you need. So your job as an audience member is to ask the difficult questions for the JPL scientist. Okay. Hello. Okay, good. Um, we also have one of the uh, co-organizers and sponsors of the Center for Theater and Learning, which is uh, Cassandra Horry and her team. Why don't you guys come up? Come up. All right, so on behalf of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach, we want to welcome you. And um, I'd love to have all of our graduate students here at Caltech introduce themselves. They're going to be working the crowd with an interactive app called Skies, gathering more questions from the audience. And they'll be great to interact with. So come on up. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Zach Erickson, and I'm a first-year grad student in environmental science and engineering. Hi, my name is Kat Saad, and I'm a fourth-year grad student in environmental science and engineering. Uh, hello, my name is Magnus Hall, and I'm a second-year student in plasma physics to break the environmental engineering trend. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Jin Chen. Okay. I'm the third year grad student in environmental science and engineering. I'm studying the global and regional climate change. Hi, my name is Anne Lorea. I'm a fourth year graduate student in environmental science and engineering. Hi, I'm James Maloney, and I am the co director of the Community Science Academy. I'm Mitch Aiken, and I'm not a graduate student. I'm the Associate Director for Educational Outreach in the Center. Uh, I just want a big thank you to Susan Callery from JPL of wrangling all of your scientists coming down here to Caltech. Yay, um, Susan. Yeah, Susan Callery. And um, Annie Richardson over there. Oh, and Annie Richardson. Big shout out to Annie Richardson over there. Yeah, she is. Uh, I want to say big thank you to my co-producer Arden Thomas. Um, and I'm going to introduce Laura Tenenbaum, who is an education specialist up at JPL and Glendale Community College, and she is going to be our air traffic controller today for people who are twittering and in the U-verse world of online information management and questioning around the globe. So I'm gonna turn it over to Laura Tannenbaum and you will introduce these fabulously groovy people up on the stage with you, yes? I will. Cool. But first of all, I want everybody, you guys are too far away. You maybe thought that scientists bite um, and we do, but I've told them that they're not allowed to bite you tonight. So you got to come in and we're going to say hi to all the Ustream audience out there. Thank you for joining us. Come closer. I promise I'll hold them back. They will not jump out from behind this table and attack you. I, I promise. Um, so the people I'm talking about, this is Josh Fisher here to my left. Um, he studies the biosphere. Come on, come on, keep coming. We love you. Come, come, come. Thank you. Um, he studies the biosphere, and you're going to get to ask him uh, all kinds of questions about the terrestrial biosphere and how uh, climate change is affecting that. And over um, second is Dave. And he looks at carbon dioxide concentrations in Earth's atmosphere. And over here is one of your own, Julius 
who um, <laughs> is developing an app, and it's, he's going to be coming out there to join you shortly. So um, let's just, does anybody have a question that they want to ask right now just to start this off from, from this group? Hi. Okay. Um, just turn the microphone around. Perfect. And ask us a question. So one of the scariest uh, climate statistics I've heard is from Bill, publicized by Bill McKibben saying that um, we can burn less than half of the proven oil reserves and still keep within the two degrees centigrade uh, temperature increase that the IPCC has uh, been promoting as a limit. So I haven't heard as much of that from the scientific community or the IPCC and, or in the publicity around the IPPC reports. And I'm curious if there's any consensus on a carbon budget, because that to me is a very essential thing. It affects the, you know, the pricing of, of petroleum you know, and then the fact that they're still digging in even more expensive uh, sources of carbon like tar sands and things like this. So I mean, it's a very important statistic and I just haven't heard anybody besides Bill McKibben make a big thing out of it. So let me just understand your question correctly. You're saying that um, we can burn less, less than, than half, half of the proven reserves of, of what's of, in the ground right, now. Right. right. That's and what, that's that what Bill will, McKibben's been saying. That will yeah. take us to two, two to two degrees centigrade. To two degrees. Okay. So um, who wants to take that? Dave? Dave's question. Okay. Dave's question. Okay. Right now, burning the, fo burning the fossil fuels as we are right now, we're burning about, uh, we're putting about 39 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. This itself is not sustainable. It's certainly true that if you burned all of the known reserves of carbon, of, of, of carbon bearing fuels, of, of fossil fuel, you probably will have pushed the Earth's carbon dioxide budget well above the 450 to 500 parts per million range that has a lot of us very, very worried. A bigger problem with that that you're not noting here is that once you emit the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it tends to stick around for a while anywhere from about 300 to 1,000 years. So it's a problem that we're building into the future that's going to take a long time to solve. I the want to just um, interrupt you for a second. So you said 39 billion tons per or year. total per year. 39 billion tons of carbon dioxide being emitted into the atmosphere every year. That's about five and a half tons of carbon dioxide for every man, woman, and child on this planet. But we're Americans. We're overachievers. <laughs> a few years ago, I would have been sitting on a podium like this, and I probably did, and I said that the average American emits about 20 tons of carbon dioxide into the air every year. I can report now with some happiness that We've actually come down a little bit, and I had to revise my numbers. Currently, Americans per capita emit about 16 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year, each. So each one of us, every man, woman, and child in this country. I also used to say that the average Chinaman emitted about two tons of carbon dioxide into the air every year. Now. It's a lot more than that. And have it's you done these to seven, calculations? Yeah, it's you, close to he's done these calculations. He's being modest. He's actually himself done these calculations. He's not just uh, reiterating someone else's math or someone else's work. But it's really he easy. He himself has done the calculations <laughs> it, to it figure this out. It turns out this is easy math. But what we found is that the average Chinaman now is actually emitting about seven tons of carbon dioxide. There are a lot more Chinamen than there are U.S. citizens, for example. Uh, and it's that, those, those are the, the, the amount of carbon dioxide being emitted by China now exceeds that being emitted by the U.S. In fact, it has it, it it is, it is ex, uh, exceeded the U.S. emissions since about 2007. Fifty-seven percent of all of the carbon dioxide currently being emitted into the atmosphere by human activities are now being emitted by developing countries, countries that are trying to come up to the level that we've, we're already at. They're doing it by burning fossil fuels. We're just now learning how to mine out of the ground. It should be past the peak of fossil fuels. That's what was predicted a few years ago. But we found a lot more. 
and we're going to continue finding a lot more. And as we burn those fossil fuels, we just keep kind of digging the hole a little deeper that we're already in. So and Julius, it is a has someone tweeted a question or there, are you streamed? There are three questions on Skies right now. Okay, so uh, can you pick one? Pick yes, the best one. The best one. Um, well, I'll pick a simple one that you okay. guys have probably heard a long time. <laughs> okay. That is, isn't it too early to tell? It has only been 50 years, right? So why don't, Josh, you can go for that one. Too He's tell. laughing. <laughs> too early to tell what? <laughs> Too early. So he, the question is, isn't it too early to tell whether or not we're changing the climate? Yeah, Actually, I mean, Laura. That, it's a good question because it's, you know, climate happens on large timescales and that's pretty hard to understand. You know, it's hard, hard to kind of conceptualize. We know if it's raining on us, we know if the, the, the weather is raining, but that's not climate. It has to kind of occur for a long time, you know, like 30 years at least minimum. So we've been, we've been changing the climate for climate time scales and we've already been seeing impacts um, and, and effects so I, I do a lot of work on the land so um, interested in droughts and floods and ecosystem health and, and crop um, sensitivity to changing temperature um, but of course we're already seeing oceans rise and ice melt so we're definitely seeing a lot of changes already um, now, of course, the Earth's temperature changes naturally. Um, it's gone up and down since the history of the Earth. Um, and what we've seen is that the temperature over the last few hundred thousand years kind of goes up and down and up and down. And lately, it's gone out, way outside those bounds. And that's a little bit different than the natural cycle. Um, and, and, and that's basically the, the human influence. Well, and we're here tonight celebrating Earth, Wet Earth Day, and there's going to be a, a play called Dr. Keeling's Curve. And he, Dr. Keeling, was here at Caltech and first started measuring it, uh, what is it, 1955? In the very beginning, the first measurements were made in the, in the mid-50s, uh, and then finally his first, his fi uh, his first permanent site uh, installed on, on Mauna Loa in Hawaii was finally installed and was making very regular measurements starting in early 1958. So that's 70 years of not just a little bit of measurements, but very clear, very precise measurements. And you know, working at NASA this this year, this fall, we're about to launch a brand new carbon observing NASA mission that's going to um, look at carbon dioxide even more precisely. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about well, that? Well, just just to start with. What we've been doing for 50 or actually closer to, to 60 years now is making precise measurements of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. We can actually extend that record far back, far be before that. Uh, we actually can make very precise measurements of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere now about 800,000 years back by looking at bubbles and ice cores and using other proxies for the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so we've been watching that for a long time. For most of the time, for most of the last 800,000 years, the carbon dioxide abundance of the atmosphere has been oscillating between about 150 parts per million and about 300 parts per million. Really has not gone outside that range. Now it's 400 parts per million. When did this all start? Well, let me put it in perspective. When I graduated from high school, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was about 330 parts per million it's now about 400 parts per million. We've seen a 25% increase in the carbon dioxide abundance in our atmosphere since I graduated from high school. Now, most of you will look at me and say, well, that must have been a long time ago, and you're right. <laughs> but at the same time, in my lifetime, I have seen human beings and human activities truly change the world in ways that it hadn't changed, that used to take millions of years to change by natural processes. And I've seen it in my lifetime. That's remarkable. And think so, about this too, I'll just add, for those of you who are young in your 20s now, I mean, hopefully you're gonna get a chance to live as long as any of us 
old, well, you're not old, but any of us other old people up here. So think about what might happen in your lifetime, and if our lifetime it's changed, what did you just say, 20%, 25%, 25%. What's going to happen in your lifetime? And I just, before we uh, do the next question, can we have, um, if people want to come up here more for any of you guys who just showed up, you're welcome to come forward. Did you have something else to say, we, Josh? Oh, no, no, let's just move on. Yeah. Okay, another, does anybody from the crowd have another question before we go to Julius? Step up to the mic. Step up to the mic. Any of you, someone in the crowd? Okay. Uh, here we go, here okay, we go. here comes somebody. Yay. What keeps anybody in the world from not understanding that there is climate change? Why do they object to it? Why is it that they don't grok it, as they say? Yeah, I'll, really I'll go for that. Why do people still, okay, so the question was, why are there still people who don't believe in climate change? And I would ask you back, why are there still people who smoke cigarettes? Um, it's called habit. I think, and this is just my opinion, I'm, there, I'm not a scientist on opinion, on uh, people behavior, none of us are, but um, I think there, there's a, a habit where we're stuck to our, our ways, some people, or many of us, all of us to some degree are stuck to our ways. So there's an awful lot of people who smoke cigarettes who know that they're bad for their health and yet still do it because they don't know how to not do it anymore. And it's... I think it's sad, personally, that um, you know we have a hard time changing as, as a species. So, I don't. I'm not a psychologist, but I've seen some of the climate psychology literature, and and that's a question. Is is that's a good question? You know, the science says something. How can you um, think otherwise? Um, there's good reasons. You might not trust science, or you might not trust government or you might not trust you know if you're a developing country you might not trust america or europe or something like that um but th th they do a lot of this kind of psychological research and a lot of it comes down to well and, and of course then there's propaganda you know saying the otherwise but one analogy that i kind of like is why do we why do we know that um the sun doesn't revolve around us Right, we see the sun up there. It, it it's kind of inherent. We would believe, unless science tells us otherwise, that the sun revolved around us. Or why do we, why do we not think that the Earth is flat? According to our eyes, it looks flat. Um, and and so there's kind of a natural, a natural instinct to, um, to disbelieve a major change because you're not seeing it unfold before your eyes like in a rapid kind of way um, and you know a, a lot of that is just part of human nature you there, there has to be that thinking part that comes that comes across there has to be that questioning part if someone tells you there is no climate change do you just believe it if I tell you there is climate change do you believe me right and so one thing as a scientist that we're trying to get everyone to do is to question us Right? Question us, question what you hear, because that's what science is all about, is questioning. Um, and yeah, I, I think that um, I'll add we to need that. to encourage that some more. Yeah, I'll add to that too. What he said about um, you know, the fact that there is no sunrise and sunset. It's really the sun is staying in the same place and the earth is revolving. But even in our language, we still call it sunrise and sunset left over and um, people knew that the earth was not flat the first people calculated it about 300 BC but our society as a whole didn't start to acknowledge that till you know a, over a thousand years later and same with um, the fact that the earth w is revolving rather than the sun moving around that was discovered you know um, by Galileo and Copernicus um, and yet it wasn't accepted by the society for many, many years. So it's normal for a scientific um, body of knowledge that's very well supported by all the evidence to not be understood by society for many, many, many years. And the difference between climate change as an issue is that b by the time all of society finally understands it, it's just happening really quickly. Does, do you want to add something about that? 
I'll add a couple of things. First of all, a, a part of the answer to what you've just heard, why are there people who still don't, who still do not believe in climate change? That's actually only part of the question. The other, of course, is, is that climate change caused by us? Or is it something that's natural and would have happened anyway? Because climate change has happened in the past. Part of the, part of the reason for that is something that nobody said, but it, you're kind of hinted at it. We're a little bit lazy. We're intellectually lazy. We don't want to change our way of thinking if we've been thinking one way. We have long thought that we didn't have any control over our environment. And as we've gone through life and, and gone through uh, culture and civilization, the whole part of it was to control our environment. Guess what? <laughs> we are. Since the beginning of the 20th century, certainly, we've been making, taking much better control of our environment. And we have been making changes in it, some of them for the better, some of them for the worse. I actually like air conditioning. But I can understand that things like air conditioning require the use of energy, and the use of that energy actually has consequences, which is the release of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. We can measure carbon dioxide being released in our atmosphere, and we can see that we're doing that. We also can determine through laboratory measurements that it actually does change, it actually causes the Earth's atmosphere to trap more heat. So we can learn all of these things, but part of what Josh touched on is, is really part of the, the real piece of information here that we have to start taking advantage of. As scientists, we learn and understand things about the world around us by observing them, asking questions, making measurements, designing experiments, and testing, testing, testing until we get the answer again and again and again. And that's how we answer questions like, is the climate changing and are we contributing to it? The general public doesn't always do that. They actually take, take our word for it as scientists, or they take the average talk show host's uh, word for it, unfortunately, thinking that they know as much. Or worse yet, they take a politician's word for it, thinking that they know as much. And they do that because, once again, we're a little bit lazy, and we don't want to actually go and do the research ourselves. But you know what? It's not that hard these days to go and do the research yourself. The measurements that we take are tested again and again and again, and we publish them in every possible way, including on the internet. Simple Wikipedia searches, you can actually go and learn a lot of this stuff. Just go and do it. Take a look at it. See if we're right about this. Look at the numbers that we see that convince us. If it convinces you, great. If it doesn't, ask the question. We'll go and look at it again and we'll try to convince you again. But our job really isn't so much to convince you. Our job is to understand what's going on in the world around us. That's our job. So some argue that scientists are crummy communicators and we're not good at transferring the message to the general public. We I'm are. sorry, that's true. We, we are, are crummy <laughs> communicators. <laughs> we're geeks and nerds. And we're not good at that. Our job, though, is to make those good measurements, to actually understand those measurements and understand the world around us. And that's what we're good at. The other thing we're good at is getting that information into some other form that at least others can test. It may just be other scientists, but others can test. And we're always willing and interested in others inspecting our work and seeing if they believe it too. If they don't, we have to do it over again. And nobody is more critical of science than other than scientists. Other yes. scientists, absolutely. And so. I'll just add that even by the fact that some scientists are here today, they're practicing communicating, so they have a, a small hope uh, of improving their skills. Yeah. Um, and then I just want to throw a pitch for um, uh, the climate website at NASA. It's climate.nasa.gov. And it's open to the public. And all of the Earth science data that um, Dave was just telling you about is available for the public to view. So um, if you want to do what he said, you can find that information, climate.nasa.gov. And Julius, do you have another question, or do you want to talk about the app for a second? Well, I can always talk about the app for hours, um, but there's actually 17 questions that have come in since you guys okay, were talking. We'll, we'll try to answer okay. them faster. <laughs> so, all 17, right away. All 17, yeah. rapid fire. No, I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do them randomly. So one of them is, since the climate is changing and the water levels are rising, and I've heard that it would take 1,000 years for the water levels to go down, is there any way we could speed up the process of Alleviating the effects, right, I assume. Right. right. <laughs> Speeding up the process of making it go faster. <laughs> making it worse, yeah. No, yes, ma burn making it lots better. of fossil fuels. Uh, Do you want to start, Dave? Just real quickly, 
Uh, yes, there are ways to speed up the process. The first uh, part of the, the situation is stop adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases uh, that, that are causing the problem. And you need to do that as soon as possible because the more you put in, the more you're stuck with for a very long time. The second thing that you can do actually is start to find ways to do what we call sequester carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to take them out of the atmosphere. This will take some research, it'll take some effort, but we could do that and that could bring the system uh, back into equilibrium, back into the state that we're more used to, much faster than a thousand years. Okay. Josh? Absolutely. Uh, we'll just move on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next, Next question. question. Next question. Uh, let's see. Well, okay, this is probably a repeat. What types of realistic policy changes do you think are the most effective at countering climate change? Realistic policy changes. None of us are policy experts, but I'll, I'll add to what um, Dave said before. Um, what can people do as far as um, mitigating climate, the effects of climate change, is, um, you know, there's a lot of energy efficiency things. He was talking about um, releasing less or stop polluting the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, and one of the ways to do that is to be more efficient. And one of the ways to be more efficient is to get together in groups like we all are doing today by celebrating Earth Day and talking about these things and you know joining together to figure out how can we become more efficient at an institution like Caltech or JPL or individually at home. How can you become more energy efficient in your own life? Um, and there's lots of different ways to become more energy efficient by purchasing more energy efficient electricity, uh, um, uh, appliances is the word I'm looking for, um, and also driving a more fuel efficient car, uh, and or also, not what, say or again? Not at all. Or no. not at all, walking more, riding your bike more, using public, tr public transportation more, um, all different kinds of ways that you can be energy efficient. There, in, in fact, there's many uh, energy efficient appliances out there that are releasing less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there's there's many ways. And as you know, students, you may be the ones who are going to invent the next more efficient item that everybody's going to want because all of us want to reduce our carbon footprint. Everybody does. Yeah. I mean, so again, not not a policy expert. Although we 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 work a lot with international kind of cap and trade, monitoring, uh, reducing um, deforestation by um, paying people not to deforest. And we're trying to get, you know, from a NASP perspective, um, good accounting on how much biomass, how, how much carbon is locked up in these trees that, could, that people might want to chop down for their livelihoods. Um, what would it be worth to, to pay them? So there's a lot of different kind of big policies. Some of the more domestic policies that I see um, you know, we do a lot of subsidies um, to promote growth, um, and we subsidize, for instance, gasoline. It's much cheaper here than it is in Europe. We could have more subsidies for renewables. Um, Absolutely. What else? Well, also, what? the other thing is maybe there's not a perfect policy, and it's going to be up to somebody in this crowd today to come up with it. I mean, you know, as an educational institution, I am always recommending that people educate themselves a around all the options and then think for yourself. So, um, yeah. Another kind of interesting, um, very international and broad um, policy approach to, to climate change. Obviously, it's, it's about the CO2 emissions, but it's also about the population growth, right? That's the kind of big elephant in the room, um, especially in developing countries. And one of, the, one of the keys to kind of managing that, which I've, which I've read about, and it might cause you to scratch your head, is um, empowerment of women um, and education of women, especially in de developing countries. The, the statistics show that um, countries with the kind of highest mobility and empowerment um, and rights of women tend to have kind of lower birth rates, not because there's health problems, but because the, the women are doing other things. They're um, staying in school is what they're doing. They're doing other things. Yeah, I've read a and, lot about And so it, it might cause you to scratch your head, empowerment of women, climate change, but if you think about it kind of further, this is, this is 
something that kind of cuts you know you can tell everyone to buy an electric car and that's all well and good but there's there's kind of more fun- fundamental tied into human rights as well absolutely um, that you, you you know it's you, you can do a lot of good with some kind of more directed approaches let's do another question okay how about or this just, just, Dave do you want to turn it okay this is no. a sharp okay. a sharp uh, divergence I'll just uh, move to the next question uh, the question is I've heard that volcanic eruptions can lead to cooler temperatures locally uh, temporarily at least is this true and does it have any implications for the lessons concerning global warming well yes it does uh, it turns out that volcanoes actually emit uh, somewhere between uh, one and, and two percent as much carbon dioxide into the air as human activities do. So they're a very small. Imp- uh, they actually do uh, were the original source of all of the carbon dioxide uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, but they're not a big source now. And in fact, they emit aerosols into the atmosphere, uh, mainly aerosols uh, smog. Are, tell the people uh, what aerosols so are. Small particles uh, of things that fly around in the air, yeah, uh, very much like the like the uh, like Ooh, like garden. LA smog. LA smog or nitric acid aerosols, um, the the aerosols that that are emitted by volcanoes are primarily sulfuric acid aerosols. Those that make it into the stratosphere actually hang around for a while, at least a few years. And the last uh, few very large volcanic eruptions that we had, uh, Chichon and Pinatubo in particular in the 80s and 90s, actually put clouds of sulfuric acid aerosols into the stratosphere that cooled the earth by a couple of degrees. That's a very big amount uh, over over the entire tropics uh, for a couple of years. And that was a tremendous impact. There are people who would like to think of doing geoengineering activities. In other words, well, if volcanoes can do it, hey, we can do it better. Uh, Let's go and put a cloud of aerosols uh, around the Earth to reflect more of the sunlight from the Earth before it's absorbed by the atmosphere and the surface, and that'll cool things off a little bit. And the answer is yes, it will, but it'll also make your world a lot smoggier. It could also make your world a lot more dangerous. It's also a great way of changing your climate in ways that maybe you can't quite predict. So it actually might add a lot more risk if we took on those kinds of activities uh, as ways of trying to correct uh, global warming. A better way to do it is to uh, simply stop emitting quite as much carbon dioxide in the air. I mean, and these volcanoes have to be big, right? I mean, you guys remember that Iceland volcano, right? I can't pronounce it. And it like shut down European, like, you know, cross Atlantic air traffic and it reduced, you know, it actually had negligible impact on Earth's climate. It wasn't that big. So like your volcanoes have got to get really big. And like, like Dave said, the last big one was like 91. Uh, you know, and that was in the Philippines. I mean, that was that was big. It lowered the temperature of the earth, and then it all kind of washed out, and things returned to normal. Two years so, later. Yeah. Two years later. So, you know, these volcanoes, um, they're interesting because, like, they ha- they do something, but not really a big player. Is there any other um, audience questions who are live here? Somebody want to step up to this mic right here? There's a gentleman. Step up to the mic. Tell us your name, and what's your name? Hey, I'm Eric. Hi, Eric. Um, I was wondering what you guys think about cap and trade in California. I don't think any of us have actually read the proposed law that's that's on that's that's going before the legislature. Uh, there there are uh, some advantages to methods like cap and trade for controlling the amount of emissions that that are that are uh, put into the atmosphere. There are also some big problems with it. And I, I uh, accept both the, the, the advantages and the disadvantages. It's probably something we should try. And it's probably something we won't get right the first time. It will probably look a lot like our, uh, our health care initiative. Uh, it'll be rolled out. It'll be bungled. Uh, a lot of people will say, then it's time to give up on it. And in fact, all it took was maybe a little more time to, to get it right. Cap and trade could be one of the tools in the box that we could use to encourage less fossil fuel use or a better use of fossil fuels in the generation of energy and, and in the use for transportation. It is certainly not the final answer. It is not the only answer. Mm-hmm. By itself, probably will not do the whole job. Once again, one tool in the box. Um, an interesting perspective on cap and trade that I heard from a philosopher um, was that <clears throat> is it and he was coming at it from like an ethical moral grounds which was if you kind of take the analogy of slavery and you put a cap and trade on slavery as a means to solving the problem 
you, you, you can only have three slaves. You can't have four slaves, right? Is that fixing the problem? It would help, um, but, you know, it, it's, it, that's, that's for the philosophers and the policy people to, to get into. I just want to throw that out there because I thought it was kind of interesting. <laughs> the other thing I will add to all of you who are tweeting or you streaming or here live is, you know, you have right here in front of you the opportunity to ask a scientist who's done actual research on the science a question. So really make the most of, uh, like, I, I understand that you want, you want to know more about policy and that sort of thing. But, um, and please write your representatives and ask them those types of questions and read up on it. But right here live for the next half an hour or so, you have the opportunity to ask a scientist a scientific question and learn a little bit more about that side. So please make the most of that opportunity. Well, feel free to ask policy questions. Or you can we'll ask a policy question. <laughs> and we will, <laughs> we will continue to deflect him what he said. Uh, we, we have another question here uh, that we could, we could read. The question is actually a pretty good one. It says, is global warming really a threat to our everyday life? Because pers I personally don't see it happening right now. Excellent question. You're Excellent. going to wait until the West Antarctic ice heat collapses and drops into the uh, Pacific and, and, and Indian and Atlantic oceans and raise sea level by nine meters before you notice? Uh, actually, climate change may not be affecting your life right now. I accept that. Uh, if you live in the Midwest and you haven't seen rain in years, uh, I'm really sorry about that. I'm sorry that that probably is climate change that's really happening and really affecting your lives today. If you live in the Midwest and you're using the Ag Agawala Aquifer, you're actually noticing most of it's going away. It is affecting your life today. It's going to affect your cost of water tomorrow. If you live in California now and you're worried about drought, well, guess what, guys? That's also climate change. Whether it's human-induced climate change or normal climate change, it's certainly affecting our lives. Uh, it's continuing to affect the lives of those, uh, of everyday life of average Americans, but the people who are most affected by climate change, unfortunately, are those that are a little far away and a little poorer than we are. People who live in the vicinity of coastlines where flooding has become more and more common. Uh, if you happen to be an Inuit living in Alaska these days, you used to have these giant ice sheets out there protecting your land uh, from giant storms in the wintertime that inundate them. Uh, the, the ice sheets have gone away, and the storms are coming in, and the places where you live don't exist anymore. So once again, even small changes in the climate can produce big changes in some people's lives. Uh, your life may not be affected today. Your future might be affected today. I just want to emphasize what Dave said about do you really want to wait till all of a sudden it's affecting you um, I know I locked my car I didn't want to wait till it was stolen or burgled to lock the car I locked it before it got anything happened to it uh, that's just one example that it happened to me tonight um, the other thing too is we're I think I'm just going to say this, we here right now are pretty wealthy. I know I have enough money to afford air conditioning during the heat waves, and I probably will. And if grocery prices go up because of agricultural changes, um, I will be able to afford groceries. And I ex expect that most of the people in this lawn right now and at home watching perhaps also have that financial abilities. But you know, being that type of a person with that kind of a, an income, does that mean that it's not happening to me, so I shouldn't do something just because that person who doesn't have the same income level that I do, it may be affecting them. They can't just turn up the air conditioner when it gets hot. Yeah. Um, I guess on. just to echo some of these points, um, I mean, and I can see where this question's coming from. I mean. Us in, in America, and um, you know, we don't we don't see it that much. You know, some sectors see it. I work on drought a lot, and you know, trying to figure out water resources and, and, and crops and stuff like that, which kind of affect us. But you know, if you got like Laura said, if you got a little bit a bit of a buffer of money, you can pay for a different food source. Like Dave said, they're affecting these de developing countries way off, right? You know, we out of sight, out of mind, right? So. But is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it really? So, I mean, if you think about it, if, if Bangladesh, for example, which is very close to the sea level, gets inundated by sea level rise, there's going to be massive displacements um, in that area. 
Um, who are the neighbors? Are they allies of the US? Are there conflicts? Are there nuclear armed um, countries that could be destabilized? Does America get involved in foreign affairs? Absolutely. We kind of do. But even and in so, America, so, even in America, so, it doesn't have to be a foreigner. So, it could be even here. So, I mean, when we talk about the, the, the not being affected necessarily, um, or developing countries could be affected, I mean, w w peace is, is far and few between, and um, we could easily get tied into international conflicts, tied to um, a climate-related um, international um, issue. There's someone at the microphone right there. Yes. Say your name. Um, I'm Armando. Hi, Armando. Hi. Um, so I like finding poetry in science. And so I was wondering, what's the most beautiful, poetic thing you found in your studies? It could be like sociological or, or in the chemistry aspect of it. I just, I don't know, in general, what's the most profound, beautiful, Thing you've discovered in your studies? That's a fantastic question. So you get to go first. That's a great question. I mean, yeah. so my mom's an artist and my dad's a scientist. I ended up being a scientist, but I, I invoke a lot of art in, in a way in, in my science. Um, but in terms of poetry, um, we, had a, we had a rapper come to JPL from Wu Tang, the Wu Tang clan, um, who some of the older generation might know. He's, he's, he works a lot on science. And, and um, I think it was Jizza. He, 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 rappers, a lot of rappers, are like poets, right? They distill issues, urban issues, conflicts into um, rhymes or, or, or ways that relate to youth or, or um, different audiences. And as scientists, I tried to draw a connection in especially with our, with our modeling, right? So we're trying to distill the Earth's, the Earth's phenomenon into elegant equations, right? Equations that describe how the Earth um, behaves, how it will behave. And there, there, there are simplifications of reality. But the more elegant we can draw those equations, um, the more beautiful they look to us nerds as scientists. But it's very analogous to how words and um, structure would come across to a poet as well. Um, can you convey an idea that ev evokes emotion as a poet? Can you um, create an equation or a, mo a mathematical model that shows us what the satellites are seeing? Um, so I, I, it might be a bit of a stretch for me to try to pretend like I'm a poet, but that's, that's as much as I can comment on that. Yeah. Your turn, Dave. Just real quickly. Uh, what a poet does is produce relationships in language that help you to remember things and help you to really get the point of the, of the poem as you move through it. That's what mathematicians and computer modelers and climate scientists and most scientists are actually doing in their everyday work. We're developing those relationships as, as uh, uh, Josh was saying, just to try to help us to understand things a little better. But it does come out making the whole system look like it fits together. And one of the most beautiful things about the system that I've seen is how well it fits together and how well it works together. And what a beautiful world we live in, in fact, that we're changing now so fast. So there is a certain art artistry in nature. And there's a balance in nature. And there's relationships in nature that look like poetry. Maintaining those are somewhat what we're after here. We're trying to say, don't break them, don't throw them away, don't destroy them unnecessarily, because they're beautiful by themselves. So maybe that's the closest thing to poetry that I can find. That's so true. So um, I just want to answer the question, too, because um, I think for me that is the reason that I chose this field was because of the way that I fell in love. I know it sounds corny, but just with the natural world and um, the way that I, in my job, like I look at images, satellite images a lot and I pick them. I pick my favorite ones and do slideshows and put them on the website. And sometimes I'll just spend my day in a closed office looking at the earth 
from space. And it's incredibly moving. Um, and I, I try to pick my favorite images and share them on, on the website. Um, that relationship that we all have as an individual to the planet as a whole um, is, for me, the, the reason that I do what I do. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Hi, my name's Jess. Um, the question that I have for you guys as scientists is, what keeps you up at night? Um, we're not gonna change anything without urgency. You know, people just don't change without something shocking them into change. So you guys are seeing like the guts of what is happening. So what, what keeps you up? What makes it so you can't sleep at night? Because I think those are the things we need to know about. We can change our washing machine and that's great, but that's really not ultimately what we need to do as a society and as a, as a planet, so. I'll go, and then, because um, I've thought about this a lot. I had to figure out a way to not be kept out at, up at night. And there's a, a lot of debate. I'm a communicator, so I work on a website, and we talk amongst ourselves, and I even wrote a blog about this recently. How much panic do we want to have? If you get too panicked, then people just freak out and can't deal with it and turn away. And if you're too passive, then, or too like, oh, we're happy, da, 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 then nobody does anything enough. So to, how to find that balance. So I think for, for me personally, I've learned to not panic and to stay up all night and to freak out. And I'm really searching for a healthy, move forward in a realistic, responsible way rather than a freak out. And I, I don't know if you said, you started your question with people won't change unless they're freaked out. No, I don't, or, sho shocked shock, into change. Shock. I don't mean freaked out. Or, okay, so people won't change until they're shocked. I don't know, I don't know. Well, they're not. What, they're not, they but people are changing though. If you look, there's so many more green options. In fact, Dave, I don't know if you were here when he was saying, we have reduced our, um, our as, a, in, as a country, we have reduced our uh, carbon footprint and there's more happening all the time. We That's haven't done true. it fast enough. That's true, but we're also fracking. So, yeah. Yeah. okay, I was just at the Museum of Earth and I saw a piece of shale for the first time. Shale is what we're, it's not, they don't like to call it fracking, they like to call it hydrological fracturing. Um, and that's the biggest example of what the people who are experts on hydrological fracturing and the shale talk about this whole thing of panic. So hydrological fracturing isn't as bad as topping off a mountaintop and burning a bunch of coal. And before we burned coal, we were actually burning whales. And I like whales, I have an oceanography background, I'd rather not burn them either. So it's all kind of, we're, we're, we are improving, and we have to kind of, I believe, we have to see our society not as this horrible thing that we freak out about and oh fracking oh my god what am i going to do but like how do i stay calm and move forward in a balanced way because i really don't think i don't know <laughs> who else is up i can take a swing at that in a in a democracy in an open society it's often rumored that you have to create a crisis before you can make anything major occur. And that's about 50% true. It doesn't always have to be a crisis, though. That's the stick. There's also the carrot. If there's some place better to go, people will go there as well. We need both a sense of urgency and an understanding that we're changing the world and it may not work out quite like we want. And we also need a place to go a better way of doing things that's known to us so we're not running from something, we're running to something that is a better life. So both a sense, uh, how do you, let me give you an idea of the sense of urgency. I, I don't know any people who are more concerned about climate change than some of the people who are making the most detailed measurements. Especially those folks who make measurements like we do from NASA with a space-based perspective where we see the whole Earth and we see how fast it's changing. Many of my colleagues see this and it's so alarming to them. 
uh, that they uh, essentially stop being scientists and, and try to just spread the word. Uh, Jim Hansen is an excellent example of a person like that. He, he basically stopped, he lost his objectivity as a scientist because he was so alarmed by what he saw as a scientist. You don't need to go that far, necessarily, to make a difference. There are others in our society, when they see a problem, they say, hey, I can go and solve that problem. I can actually go and, and make a difference here by making a contribution in solving this problem. And there are a bunch of those, and most of my colleagues are along those lines, trying to figure out how to do it. My, our policymakers, they also fall along all of these lines. There are those that are the crisis mongers who want to make this a crisis or make it not a crisis or make it a crisis that people are trying to make it a crisis. And then there are those who are problem solvers. God, I hope we can find some problem solvers here, because that's what we really need. <laughs> Thank you. Josh? What keeps me up at night? I guess my two-year-old. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and her future. Yeah. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Zach. Um, and so like everything is a trade-off in life, and, and we, we've talked about how if we keep emitting uh, greenhouse gases, that will have you know, hugely negative effects in the future. But there's a cost right now in terms of not emitting these gases. Uh, lesser developed countries need to produce CO2 in order to develop uh, into sort of first world countries. Um, how much money would you be willing to spend in order to take out one ton of CO2 in the atmosphere? Right now, that number is around 20 bucks. Uh, that's basically what a ton of CO2 would cost you in, in a country which actually controls CO2. It oscillates between about $13 and about $50. Uh, the oil companies actually pay uh, basically one, or 50 bucks per ton of CO2. They pay that money to coal companies to buy carbon dioxide emitted by coal-fired power plants uh, in order to pump into their underperforming wells to pressure, push the, uh, push the uh, oil out under pressure. That's how you make an underperforming well work. Almost all of the wells in the US work that way. So $50 is the answer to the going cost. How much would you want to pay, and how much of your personal income, of your personal effort, would you want to pay? I don't know the answer. I think it's a personal thing for everybody in the audience here and everybody on this planet. Uh, I personally have invested very heavily in not emitting CO2. I have solar panels on my roof. I drive an electric car that's charged by those solar panels. I've even replaced the roof to make it a, a, a cool solar cool roof so I don't have to spend as much on things like air conditioning and can still be comfortable. But I spent a lot on that. I don't expect others to necessarily dump money into things like that either, but I'm one of those people who is losing sleep at night, so I put a little more in. Those who are losing more sleep put more in. Those who are not losing sleep, well, hey, don't stick around too long or you'll be affected too. So did you lose less sleep after you put on your solar panel? Little tiny bit, <laughs> little tiny bit. At least I don't feel guilty every time I accelerate from zero to 60. That's true. You want to take a question Thank from you. Twitter? Let's do uh, one more Twitter. from the computer and then we'll go from take, those two people in the your, audience. Uh, what made you say that Dr. Hansen was losing his objectivity I've, I've known and worked with Jim for, uh, since the 1970s. I respect him amazingly, immeasurably, and I also respect the work that he's doing now uh, as a, uh, a, a climate change advocate, because we need those. But as he became more and more concerned about climate change, and I see this in some of my other colleagues as well, you lose your objectivity. You're so worried about the change that you are going out to prove that there's a change rather than make a good measurement or write a, a model that teaches you something new. I'm not sure that Jim ever lost his, his objectivity in an absolute way, but he certainly lost it in the sense that because he came out so strongly against climate change and carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions and black carbon emissions, that Everybody stopped listening to him from a scientific standpoint. They said, oh, he's just talking about the same stuff over again. And if he went out and, and ran new models now, which he does with his team, uh, it's, it's a, you wonder whether he's trying to prove that he was correct or whether he's trying to understand how nature works. 
As scientists, to some extent, it's more important for us to make a good measurement and validate that that measurement is correct or make an interpretation of a measurement and ensure that that's correct than it is to uh, make the point that that measurement was correct, if you understand my meaning. And that would be the point that I was making here, or trying to make here. As you become more of an advocate for anything, you lose your objectivity sometimes, but in the eyes of others, you have lost your objectivity. You've become an advocate. And I think what he's trying to say also is that there's room for all kinds of people. No. There's room for advocates. There's room for people who do scientific research and are objective. And there's certainly room for policy experts and scientists. And we just need to know who we are. I, I just thought it had become completely politicized. That's basically what I was saying yeah. to some extent. Science should not be politicized. It's unfortunate that it is. Hi. Do you want to go Hello. next? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Elaine. And um, so of all of the um, environmental friendly solutions or uh, climate change solutions that people are proposing, um, whether it's things you see marketed on TV or things politicians are doing, um, I think we can break them down into two basic categories of low tech and high tech. Um, and uh, so I'm just, that, that's very fascinating to me. And um, I was wondering what you think about um, the difference between those two, which you think is more feasible in general, um, which is easier to convince people to do. Obviously, this is Caltech, so we might lean towards the tech. But yet, we all agree that bicycles are great. Um, which are decidedly low tech. So what do you think about that divide there? You want to take it? Um, I can start. Um, so on the low tech solutions, I mean, some of the things are like tree planting. And uh, a big thing that we're actually, uh, a lot of scientists are looking at and um, is, is, is something called black carbon, or basically um, in developing countries, how they're, how they're getting warmth. You know, what are they burning? How are they cooking their food, and what gets emitted from a, a more efficient burning process versus a less efficient burning process? And there's very, very low-tech um, options for cooking, uh, cook stoves um, that produce less kind of black carbon or, or, or soot that is dark and you know, would absorb more radiation. From the high-tech um, point of view, maybe I'll pass that one to Dave. Thanks. That was, that was actually nice of you. Uh, I'm a high-tech guy. I, I love the technology. I also see the problem as a problem brought to us by technology, whether it's low-tech or high-tech. And it's a problem that could be solved by a range of, of actions, some of which are re will require some high technology, some very sophisticated technologies, maybe some that don't exist yet and we're going to be waiting on some of you guys to build. But there are lots of ways that are simple ways that are low technology that can, uh, can actually reduce the impact of climate change and the rate of climate change in very, very remarkable ways. Walking is one of them. Uh, rather than driving, uh, transportation is 30% of the emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, why have we forgotten to walk and forgotten how to walk? Uh, we used to be a walking society, uh, believe it or not. And only a century ago, uh, most of us got out and actually used our own muscles to get around. And you know, you still have those same muscles. You haven't evolved out of them. Uh, low-tech solution could make a big difference. Uh, some other things that are low-tech is, you know, living with other people is okay now. We have antibiotics and so forth. It's not like the Middle Ages. And if you live with other people and you, you actually don't have to commute 50 miles to work, uh, that's another low-tech solution, not having to do things. But I'm not a grass shirt guy. I like the high tech, and I tend to look to that first as my, my decisions, for, to make my decisions on how to mitigate climate change. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I just want to acknowledge there are lots of low tech ways as well. The, the difference I see between low tech and high tech is the low tech things don't really um, produce more impact on the environment at all in the sense that, like, solar panels, which are high tech, have a cost on the environment, mm -hmm. whereas no, lo like walking has no cost on the environment. 
Um, but the problem is, is we can't only be low tech uh, if we want to be humans. And I'm going to refer back to a conversation I had at the Museum of Earth. I was there last week. And um, so working on a climate change website and uh, climate scientists, we get a lot of hate mail, uh, a lot. Yeah, I see you got, you got a lot of hate mail too? No, all no. Not a lot. All love. I, I get we that. get a lot of hate mail. And so I was uh, talking to these guys who are experts on shale. And they're not advocates for or against this hydraulic fracturing, but they just understand the science of it. Mm -hmm. And um, they get tons of hate mail too. And he was the gentleman who was explaining to me how, you know, because uh, I wanted to learn, he was saying how that coal lopping off the top of a mountain and burning all this coal is worse than burning gas and much worse than burning whales. And he was telling this to somebody and they said, well, why do we have to burn anything? And as a species, that's kind of what defines us. I mean, humans discovered how to use fire two million years ago or more. And so it's kind of impossible not to burn something. Uh, if we want to stay stay human, which means we need to have a high tech solution as well. By the way, we had one of the Twitter questions that was pretty much exactly that question. So we answered, "Kill two birds with one stone." It's no, fantastic. No, we petted two birds. We don't kill okay. birds. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> we <laughs> fed. To, we fed two. Fed birds. two birds. Okay. Yes. Very good. With one. Uh, seed of grain. Do you want to go to the Twitter? Or? Yeah, let's go one more one, Twitter one, and one then Twitter. we'll come back. Okay. Which one do you want to go with? Um, gosh, I've got one in front of me that says Earth is a living organism, uh, same as the human body. If, the human develop, if a human develops a disease, the body works to counteract it. Is the Earth responding in the same way? Is there, and, and, and if so, uh, what are the indicative responses? Gaia? <laughs> no. Do you want to take that one, Josh? Uh, it's a good question. Um, yeah, and I, and I guess like a living organism, they, a de disease can kill it. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't necessarily counteract Global it. warming is not a fever that's likely to, to kill off the uh, processes that are causing it, though. And so in, to that extent, that analogy doesn't go quite that far. Yeah, I mean, so the way, the way I look at it is, is, is you know, from, from ecosystems, forests, species, plants, and... Um, you know, I, I, I've spent years in the Amazon trekking through, trying to figure out, you know, these, these are what we consider the lungs of our planet. How are the lungs responding to this warming? It's, it's fiercely intense uh, in, in the Amazon. Every spe there's, you know, thousands of species competing for every little bit of space and light. And I've also climbed up and down um, all the way up the Andes into the cloud forest. Um, and one of the questions that we looked at are, uh, is, can, can these species, can these forests escape the heat by going up slope? How fast is it warming? How fast can they move? They're moving like a bat out of hell. They are moving fast wow. up slope. They're not moving fast enough. It's actually warming faster than that they're able to, to move. So in terms of the earth as a, as an, as a living organism or a collection of, of organisms. Um, there's definitely responses. There, there are winners in climate change. There are losers. Um, there are, you know, in the northern hemisphere where most of our land is, it's warming. Um, and that's providing better growing conditions for a lot of plants. Um, but in other, other places like the tropics, there's more and more severe and intense droughts. And there are plants that are losing. Um, so, from a global perspective, who wins, right? You know, do we get more plants in the norm northern hemisphere to offset the, the plants that are dying in, in the tropics? Um, the northern hemisphere still doesn't get that much light. Um, the you know, cockroaches the are going to win. The cockroaches are going to win. So, but one of the big things that um, our group is doing at JPL is trying to figure out that, that net carbon loss versus gain. Wh who wins? Um, and really, the tropics are, are, are the lungs, and, and they're starting to, um, to, to die back a little bit. Just real quickly, as NASA scientists looking at the Earth from space, one of the things we're actually trying to work like are doctors, diagnostics, diagnostic uh, doctors, who are trying to understand the health of our patient. 
We have temperature sensors. Think of the th thermometers your doctor uses. We, we measure the respiration of our planet, how it emits uh, many different gases, not just greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere and reabsorbs them. Uh, we watch that very carefully. We watch uh, cloud cover. We watch uh, the, the, the number of acres of land that are covered by trees. We watch the salinity of the ocean and the currents of the ocean uh, at, from space. And so we're basically acting like a doctor trying to diagnose the patient. So even though I can't think of any cases where the Earth is really kind of springing back and pushing the disease agent away, uh, I can say that scientists are acting like doctors, trying to diagnose the health of the environment that we're living in, help us to understand it better uh, so that we know how we can live better in the future. Uh, so that's one, one area where uh, there is an analogy there. But we should probably go to the locals. We got one more question here. Yes, there's a lot of factory animal production. Uh, that causes a lot of methane, and methane, from what I understand, is a huge uh, effector on the climate. Can you explain what can be done in regard to diagnosis and uh, solving that particular issue? We have, we have a lot to talk about methane. Yes. Um, there actually, methane is, is one of our, our, uh, our second most important greenhouse gas. Uh, it's produced by a number of processes, and right now agriculture is among the highest of the, the producers of, of methane. Uh, factory farms are uh, produce an unnecessarily large amount of methane uh, and, and could be controlled a little better than they are in that regard, they, and actually in every regard. But um, once again, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I mean, so right now NASA is very interested in methane. We're flying an airplane, an airborne mission called CARV, all around Alaska, trying to pick up methane uh, from the basically all that carbon that's been locked up there in the Arctic for centuries, kind of trapped underneath the permafrost, and the permafrost is thawing back. When you say pick up methane, you mean the sensor is trying to detect measure. it? Yeah, not actually like with a scoop. <laughs> um, so actually, like, they try to scoop yeah, it Yeah, sorry. Like too informal jargon. Mm -hmm. We, 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 we labor between too technical and too informal. We do actually capture it in little flasks. Yeah, we actually do pick it up. We actually do pick it up. Than that, yeah. Uh, bring it back to, make, to, to analyze it. But one of the big issues is uh, with methane especially is that, or, or methane from, for my British colleagues, I spent some time in England. <laughs> and I like how they pronounce it, um, is we're warming the planet. That permafrost is thawing back. And it's exposing this like centuries, millennia of, of carbon trapped under. And it's waterlogged, right? All this like ice is melting. And when it's waterlogged and exposed to the atmosphere, it can kind of burn off as, as not necessarily CO2, but as methane. And like with deforestation, you, could, you, you chop down a tree, that's bad. But you could plant a tree and get that back. With the permafrost and the soil carbon, the carbon locked in the, in the Arctic, once that goes up, it, you can't get it back. And that's, um, it's kind of like unlocking Pandora's box right there, or you know, waking the sleeping dragon, essentially. Um, and NASA is very interested in that. We're flying this airborne mission called CARV. We're about to launch an almost 10-year ground campaign of scientists coming into the, uh, to the Arctic to try to figure out how to get a handle on this. Um, the Department of Energy is heavily involved in this as well. So, you know, methane is definitely a big deal. We're also getting, trying to get new satellite sensors to target um, methane sources, whether from landfills or from, uh, you know, cow, cow feeds um, or rice paddies, you know, all the different sources. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, definitely interested in methane. Next question. Do you want to bring one up from the... Oh, yeah. Oh, we have right one there. more local. Uh, if you don't mind backtracking to the uh, issue of geo geoengineering for yes. a moment, I'm wondering whether even given all of the drawbacks of geoengineering, can you foresee a, us getting to a point where we have to consider some geoengineering techniques in order to head off some really serious uh, effects here on Earth? And if so, how much time do you think we have to either get there or see some really major reductions in emissions of greenhouse gases? To some extent, uh, the uh, little experiment we're running night, right now by dumping a bunch of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is a geoengineering experiment. Geo Whether we like it or not, it's an inadvertent experiment that we're doing on ourselves, kind of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, and, and actually, in the future, as we can predict the climate's evolution better, 
we'll be in a good position to start thinking about geoengineering tasks. The real trouble now is that we can't even predict the slow natural changes in the climate. And our, cha our, our impacts on the climate are, are mostly surprising us. Uh, back in, in the 1970s, uh, uh, a couple of our colleagues at Caltech uh, discovered that adding chlorine to the stratosphere uh, could actually be a problem for ozone, and they made some dire predictions about uh, chlor chlorine, or I should say, uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, CFCs, uh, used for air conditioning and cleaning and everything else, uh, could affect the ozone layer. And they they put out a lot of predictions, and then we actually it was dire enough that politicians took note, and they actually stopped the production of these chemicals uh, to to prevent dire consequences for the stratosphere and the ozone layer. But nobody predicted the ozone hole. Early 80s came along, and we measured it for years. We didn't even believe our data because it looked so weird. We can't predict how changes in our system, how changes in our behavior, will actually affect our climate system to the kind of precision that we need in order to start doing surgery on our climate using geoengineering today. But will we be able to do that in the future? Gosh, I think so. I'm a great fan of science fiction, and I love the idea of being able to control the weather uh, and predict the weather infinitely far in the future because you are controlling it, and the same thing for the climate. I'm hoping that we'll learn enough to do that one day. We're not quite there yet. Yeah, for, I mean, in, ter we, in terms of looking at the viable geoengineering solutions, right, you've got iron fertilization in the ocean to get the plankton to grow and draw down the CO2, but then what happens to the iron and how does that affect fish and circulation. We've got sucking the CO2 out of the atmosphere. How do you do that? Where do you store it? How well does it get stored? Um, so, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these are, hard, uh, you know, solutions or potential solutions are hard to test in terms of the impacts and the, and the, the downstream impacts. I mean, we're talking about a global problem and you could introduce you know, you could have an invasive species and you introduce a, a predator that becomes an even worse problem, right? Um, and and those, are, those are hard to test. Uh, more philosophically, um, who controls that, right? That's a lot of power to control Earth's climate. Um, what happens if it's, it's, if it's privately owned, privately controlled? They, that would wield you know, a lot of power um, that needs to be thought about. What happens if we're moving CO2 successfully and we stop? Does, is there a system shock? Does the system go into shock because um, because it's, it's such a, you know, abhorrently unnatural change in the system. Um, so there's a lot of these things that, um, you know, we, we don't know a lot about, but it's, it's definitely, we got to think about. And I personally hope that we don't. I know Dave just wants to do jeer and just on this table, you've got somebody who wants it, somebody who doesn't want it, and somebody who just needs to learn more. I, so. I, I, I'm certainly not an advocate for, for doing geoengineering currently. And I, I think that uh, it's basically just, just predicated on the fact that we don't understand the system well enough to understand the long-term impact of the changes that we're introducing. And so um, that, that's my main concern at this point. But in the future, hey, you know, maybe it turns out being the solution or a part of it. Or better than the alternative. Yes. Yeah. One more tool in the box. So um, I'm just going to take this opportunity to thank everyone for being here and to thank my fellow panelists up here. And I know that the play is going to start in a few minutes. So um, I think we're going to wrap well, this up. Feel free to email us. And you, know, you can find us. Send us hate mail. You, you, know. you can send, send him <laughs> hate mail. I, I don't get enough. It's all about balance. And I don't, quick you know. question. Uh, do you have a website for this? Uh, it, climate dot nasa dot gov then we'll leave it at that thank yeah, you thanks. for joining us thanks all very good questions and, and thanks thanks for all the folks uh, on the uh, on the uh, that was great. <laughs> yeah.